Great. So first I'd like to introduce you to Michaela Trimble. Uh, Michaela is a postdoc fellow of the graduate program in coastal and oceanic systems at the Center for Marine Studies, Federal University of Parana, uh, South Brazil. After pursuing, pursuing her master, uh, bachelor and master's in biological sciences at the National University of Uruguay, where she's from, uh, she undertook the interdisciplinary PhD program at the University of Manitoba, uh, Natural Resources and Environment Management. Um, she graduated there last year, and since 2010, uh, she's been conducting research in coastal fishing communities of Uruguay and Brazil, uh, looking at issues surrounding fisher participation uh, in resources management. Her postdoc research project is on the evaluation and adaptive co-management of small-scale fisheries in coastal Uruguay and Brazil, and the whole uh, uh, issue of evaluation is an important one to us. So, welcome, Kayla. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, in uh, the middle of the table over here is Mark Anderchuk, who again is a, a friend and colleague. We, uh, we started our PhD at the same time at uh, Wilfrid Laurier, and he's a little bit further along. And, uh, uh, it's, it's nice to see him here today presenting on some of his work. Um, he's going to be presenting on uh, perception of social ecological change in uh, uh, Cow High and Lagoon, Vietnam. So, more on that in a bit. He's a PhD uh, candidate in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management at the University of Waterloo. Um, his current research is looking at collaborative networks related to fisheries and aquaculture management in uh, coastal lagoon in Vietnam. Uh, this research draws on resilience thinking to help understand the linkages between management processes and ecological outcomes. Uh, prior to this uh, research, Mark worked on a project related to climate change adaptation in the Canadian Arctic through the University of Guelph. Uh, some of you may uh, know the caviar project. And finally, uh, uh, in, uh, at the end there is Pratit Nayak, who's going to be talking about his work in uh, uh, small-scale lagoon fisheries in the east coast of India uh, through fisher metaphors and telling stories. Now, Pratit is, is, is an assistant uh, professor at SEED, which is the School of Environment, Enterprise and Development at the University of Waterloo. Uh, his academic background is in political science, environmental studies, and international development. Uh, he has an active interest in combining social and ecological perspectives. Uh, Pratip's research focuses on the understanding of complex human environmental connections or disconnections. I think that's a, 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 an interesting uh, characterization. Uh, with particular attention to change, uh, its drivers, their influence, and possible ways to do it. His main research interests include commons, environmental governance, social ecological system resilience, environmental justice, and political ecology. In the past, Pratip has worked as a development uh, professional in India on issues around community-based governance of land, water, uh, and forests, focusing specifically at the interface between research, uh, implementation, and public policy. Uh, Pratip is a past Trudeau scholar, a Harvard Georgia Buffalo Fellow in Sustainability Science, a Shirk Banton Fellow, uh, and a recipient of Canada's Government General Academic Gold Medal. So, welcome today uh, to our uh, to our panel. We're looking forward to uh, your insights, particularly as we move forward in terms of our own uh, research and research projects. Thanks, Matt. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my presentation is about transdisciplinarity and participatory research as a transdisciplinary approach. Um, I'm going to start with this approach called Science with the People. So, Fundowitz and Rebex are two philosophers of science who argue that in post-normal science we need to involve non-academics in the process of doing research and understanding complex problems like in our case, are environmental problems. And they also argue that, that we need to have an extended peer community, not only involving academics, but stakeholders and people that are affected by the problems that we are trying to understand and to solve in a way. There are several arguments to support this uh, citizen or stakeholder participation in, in research and also in decision making. And one is the substantive argument that says that the local knowledge or knowledge that these people affected by a problem have can contribute in a significant way to be looking for solutions for, for the problem that we are looking at. 
So, um, one of the approaches in this science with the people context is participatory action research, also called participatory research or community-based research. There are many definitions for this approach, but there we have um, in that box some main features. So, it's, a, it's a, an approach that has an action-oriented component. It's about looking for solutions to local problems and involving the community or the stakeholders throughout this adaptive process. It has multiple aims and outcomes, and that includes uh, community empowerment, development, and also learning and co-production of knowledge. And all these are also aspects of transdisciplinary research. Because of these expected outcomes, it's not surprising that this approach has been increasingly used or found in the context of natural resources and, and environmental management, where we face complex and uncertain problems and we need to bring together different sources of knowledge. So today, I'm going to share with you this experience of a participatory research group in coastal Uruguay. It's a participatory research case that originated in 2011 during my PhD work. Um, there we have, so here we have the Rio de la Plata estuary that is shared between Uruguay and Argentina. Piliapolis is this place where this participatory research was initiated. And the red arrow shows where I live there. One day if you want to come visit, let me know. These are the small scale or artisanal fishing boats in Piliapolis port. Uh, just a, um, a brief introduction to, to the fishery. These are the three main species that are being caught. And the gillnets and long lines are the two main fishing gear that they, that they use throughout the, the Rio de la Plata. So back in 2011, um, I went to the fishers. I had been working there for, for several months. And I went and I said that I wanted to invite them to be part of a participatory research initiative that would aim to address local problems, but that they, they would be part of this, of, of a group that would look for solutions for those problems. At first, that seemed awkward, and they thought that they, I was asking them what I, was, what I had to investigate to solve their problems. After a while, they got the, the, the idea, and some of them wanted to participate, and others just wanted to be informed of what's going on. Um, so Fisher said that the main problem that they were facing was the interaction with sea lions and these sea marine mammals feed from the fish cut in gillnets and long lines and so they not only fish, they not only eat their fish but also damage the fishing gear. So based on that main initial problem, I invited to, to join this initiative the university scientists that were doing research in these areas also the fisheries agency that is in charge of fisheries, but also marine mammal management, and NGOs in the area, for instance, one that, uh, whose main goal is to protect marine mammals and other uh, animals. After some months and of working together, meeting regularly, addressing different topics and thinking of solutions, the group came with this name, uh, popa, which means stern, so it's the back part of the boat, but translating that, uh, so the meaning of the group to English is for artisanal fisheries in Minneapolis. So despite their differences in, in viewpoints, they had one interest in common, and that was the fishery. They, these all stakeholders wanted to do something to improve the fishery, not in terms of fish only, but in terms of, of the fishers and the people who depend on these resources. So, so we started by addressing the interaction with sea lions. The problem was, was analyzed from different perspectives and based on Fisher's concerns and gaps in scientific knowledge, the uh, research question was defined and that was the interaction with long lines, that is uh, costly fishing gear, so that was the main interest for, for the fishers. And the, these different stakeholders worked together to generate a data collection protocol and they defined how they would do this research to address the question. For several reasons, that, that got stuck at that point and they didn't proceed to the stage of doing the, the experiments or the data collection phase. And at the same time, during the second workshop in Piriapolis, Fishers brought another problem that they wanted to share with the group and to see if they, there was something that they could do. And that was the market competition with imported fish 
So there's this catfish also called basa that is being imported from, from Asia and it's sold at, at a very low price and so they were having trouble to sell their local fish. After analyzing that problem and after the fisheries manager saying that there was nothing they could do because it, part of their policy is to, to continue importing fish so that they can export more fish, most of the catches in Uruguay of the what they catch both the small scale and the large scale fishing sector is for exports. Based on that, the group decided instead to do a communication strategy to, to, to share and to inform society about the fishery, about the people who work in the fishery, and about the properties of the local fish, and how important it was to buy local fish instead of this cheap <coughs> import fish. One of the main activities of this communication strategy was the first artisanal fisheries festival, that took six months or a little bit more to be organized and it took place during a weekend in February 2012 in Piriapolis. Um, fishers were showing their long lines and gillnets. There was a photo exhibition where the people could get to know the fisher, how, what the fishers do in, like, in a regular day. Uh, we had, there were some interviews to, to the media. This is a sticker that we made to, to promote the consumption of, of local fish. And this was considered the main accomplishment of the group. 3,000 people attended and, and the group saw this event as something that, that united them and, and brought them closer to continue working together. So throughout this process, uh, sometimes on a monthly basis, I was doing interviews with them all, fishers, managers, researchers, and NGO members, to understand how they were evaluating the process, what, how they, they saw that it was going, what they were learning, how relationships were changing. And so here I'm going to share some of the, these outcomes from the first year. So these are findings from, from the interviews conducted right after the Fisheries Festival. And I wanted to highlight these four. Uh, first, relationships among most of the participants improved. In some cases, these were new relationships, so these are actors that were, were not connected before this case. So, for instance, between fishers and, and one of the NGOs. And, and trust increased in, in most of the cases. For instance, between the fishers and the fisheries manager, and it's worth saying that uh, usually when you are in different locations, fishers have a, a tense relationship with, with the government that has traditionally supported the large scale sector, and there are many other reasons for, the, for them to be uh, conflicting. In, so in relation to that, I'm talking about conflicts. One, another outcome of this process was that um, some of the exist, existing conflicts were laid between the fishers and the fisheries manager, and also between fishers and scientists. So because of these opposing interests and viewpoints regarding the sea lion interaction, there was, there was some conflict and tension in the initial workshops, and that's something that changed over the months, and it was noticeable after the first Artisanal Fisheries Festival. Um, a third outcome that I wanted to highlight, highlight is the co-production of knowledge. There were many opportunities in which local and scientific knowledge were, were brought together, and they had to dialogue, they had to interact. It wasn't easy. But there, were, there are some, some products, let's say, that uh, even participants highlighted as, as, uh, as something that shows that there, these different types of knowledge were integrated. And one was this data collection protocol to understand the sea lion impact on, on long lines. Learning and learning through interacting with others, this social learning was something that occurred throughout the process. And I brought here some, some of the findings after the, the fisheries festival. Here we have, uh, these were closed-ended questions in which I asked them to, to what degree, like nothing, either moderate or much, they have learned certain skills. These are all skills that are important for participatory process. And uh, so in red we see those in which like, more than half of the participants learned to moderate or to much uh, degree. And so we have their like, communication skills, and they also learn to be more tolerant of other views that were, so other views that participants had in that group. And they learn to reflect on their own opinions after hearing or listening what others thought about a certain thing that they were discussing. 
I also wanted to know what had helped them learn about, or about learn these skills or other kind of learnings that occurred. And, and, and they explained that the, the, the time that they had to interact either during workshops or when organizing the festival, all those were, were important elements. And they also highlighted the diversity of stakeholders, uh, something that, that fostered learning, and the horizontal and respectful dialogue that, that, that they had. Similarly, uh, when I asked them what had helped them improve their relationship with others, they also referred to this inter-participant exchange and this face-to-face um, -face interaction. They also refer to uh, the consideration of everyone's opinion equally in the workshops and to horizontal and respectful dialogue. So based, based on these findings, like these findings uh, like made me or supported my argument that participatory research involving different stakeholders can be seen as a platform for learning and for building networks. And these three uh, things or aspects here, face-to-face -face interaction, horizontal and respectful dialogue, and having a common goal were both important for promoting learning and for helping changes in relationships. Uh, just as an example, uh, this is a picture of one of the workshops, and before each workshop we would explain these rules for good dialogue, and for instance, listen carefully to what others said or be respectful to everyone. And this is something that, that fishers, for instance, they, 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 have, they remember like as if we were doing this like nowadays. And especially they refer to, to the one that says, be open-minded when listening to others' opinion which might differ from yours. So that kind of guideline before starting a discussion was something that really helped them to try to be open, even though in the room there were people with opposing views and interests. Um, here um, I brought some other process features of this participatory research case that, um, that helped achieve those outcomes and that are also like key aspects of, of participatory research or participatory action research. So the problems addressed were of key interest to local stakeholders but also to the other stakeholders involved. So it's not just a topic that is of interest to the locals but also to the others that we want to, be, to bring to the team. There was involvement of, of these different stakeholder groups in every research stage. There was facilitation and, and the, the facilitator team, we tried to encourage collective decision making after deliberation, after knowing what other things and after analyzing the arguments that were being provided. We tried to also to ensure appropriate information management in the sense of, of bringing different knowledge and, and trying to, to, to that others were also open to these other knowledge. That, that, and that's something that, that wasn't easy. There was some, some reluctancy, and there were different languages being used, and that's something that, that hampered the, the, the learning and the interaction between participants. And another key aspect of this process was the, the adaptability. So these were, this was a, a cycle of planning, acting, observing, and reflecting, but it wasn't just one step after step. It was something that had different stages at the same time, let's say. Um, this is a nice diagram that a colleague of mine uh, made. It wasn't me. <laughs> um, but so here it shows how in 2011 we started addressing the sea lion problem. Right after the beginning, we also started discussing the market competition of imported fish. We, we stopped addressing the sea lion problem and we concentrated on the, on, the, on the fisheries and the, in the importance of local fish, we organized the festival. And right after the festival, or soon after the festival, the group said that they were now ready and they were now more united to go back to address the yellow, the sea lion problem. So it was at the end of 2013 that the group worked together to define and write a research proposal to try to mitigate the impact of sea lions. And it was the fishers who proposed trying a different fishing year. These are the fish traps. Um, to see if the sea lions couldn't damage them and they couldn't access the fish. So we submitted this project. It was, it was supported. We got govern, government funding to this project. 
And Fisher's worked together with government people to design, to, to say what the size these trusts were going to have, what materials, what bait, everything. And then, uh, especially Fisher's with the biologists were working on designing the, the sampling and what they were going to see or to look at during the fishing trips. And now we are, after this collective construction here, we have a fisher explaining to a, an ecologist how to build these traps. We all have to build this, this fishing gear. And we are now in the experimental stage. So there are, we are doing, they are doing it here. Um, so these experiments to see how much these traps are catching. And sea lions so far haven't eaten anything from the traps. So we are, we are happy about it. Um, we are we are conducting or we we we've included an evaluation component throughout the process. So we have regular meetings and we discuss the challenges we are facing, what we can do to change that. This, for instance, is a table about strengths and weaknesses that we all um, and part of Pop as well that we uh, found in July this year and that we presented at the second World's Moscow Fisheries Congress that was in Mexico in September and two fishers of the group were, were there to, to share also this experience. So a strength we have, for instance, that we've been working together for three years now, the trust has increased, but also in the weaknesses, we have that it's difficult to coordinate actions and so these are different people who have different kinds of, of jobs and it's hard sometimes to, to coordinate. And also there's low fisher participation in the group and that's something that, that is a matter of concern for all of us. Um, this is briefly to mention um, that the composition of the group has changed. So it was, we were also trying to adapt according to the changing composition of the group. So the NGOs that were at the beginning are no longer there for different reasons, but now there are three members of the fisheries agency that are participating and one of them is also a member of a conservationist NGO and so we are now having a different NGO as part of the group and we now have the local government of Piliopolis being part of the group. It's something that it is changing us as we speak. So, some conclusions. Um, this research showed that participatory research is a valuable transdisciplinary approach for addressing complex problems like that we find in the social environmental interface. Some of the outcomes of this participatory research were strengthened social networks, conflict resolution, co-production of knowledge and learning, among many others. We found here that time and process really matter. So it's throughout time and throughout this process that we get to these valuable outcomes. Um, there was overlap between the phases of this participatory research that are similar also to the phases that Lang and, and, and colleagues proposed for transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary research. We are, we are facing, we have faced and we are facing challenges and those regard the participation of all parties, the language and jargon that is being used, not only by scientists but also by fishers, and this bringing together a dialogue between different sources of knowledge which hasn't been easy. And I have there some questions that I can later ask. <laughs> Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for your kind invitation uh, to this beautiful campus and your program. Uh, um, I'm going to talk about uh, a case study from the east coast of India today, and I'm not going to talk about any theory or concepts or anything. I'm going to tell you stories as the fisher friends that I work with would tell you, okay, if you happen to be there. So I'm going to tell you stories about change in one of the coastal lagoons on the east coast of India. Um, I titled this it as telling stories with uh, telling being in bottom, you know, so dual meaning in that. You know. um, so let's see what I'm going to tell you about this uh, uh, case study. So I'm going to talk about Chilika Lagoon, which is one of the largest lagoons in India, of course, but in one of the largest lagoons in Asia also. 1,200 square kilometers, uh, as you can see here on the east coast of India, here, right here. And uh, if you look at this, this is quite a biodiverse uh, uh, lagoon. Okay, it has virtually everything that makes it famous. Okay, including the Irrawaddy dolphins, which are just just below thousand in numbers in the entire world. Only a few countries have got them, and Chilika Lagoon has got 150 of them. And that makes it very famous. Okay. In addition to that, there are number of species that are in the Australian Red List, and you can see that variety there. What I always tell, you know, having worked with uh, fishers in the in the lagoon, 
that there are about 400,000 fishers which depend indirectly or directly for the livelihoods on this particular lagoon. Okay? And for me, that makes it a really complex uh, social ecological system, if, you, if you're aware of the term. Uh, it's a human environment system which is very complex, and this is how it is very, very complex in terms of being a social ecological system. Okay? However, in, uh, there has been a lot of changes that has been happening in the past few decades in this particular lagoon. Uh, I'm going to talk about two key drivers of changes in the last three or four decades. One of them is, of course, the tiger prawn shrimp aquaculture, tiger tri shrimp aquaculture, which started in the 80s in the lagoon. Uh, in the late 70s and 80s, there was an international market price that for this tiger shrimp, which went up. Uh, thereby, um, a lot of nation states tried to kind of you know bring in aquaculture as a policy. Uh, thereby, they can increase their export-oriented market. Thereby, you know, increase their export-oriented uh, uh, growth. Uh, India was not far behind. So India got up to this in 1991 in terms of neoliberal policies. But in the 80s, a large-scale aquaculture started in this particular level. This is a caste-based fishery. It's a caste-defined society. Okay. Uh, when aquaculture was started in the 1980s, uh, it is basically the higher caste people who were non-fishermen. Uh, captured the traditional customary facing areas uh, from the caste based fishers. Okay? So you will see a lot of uh, encroachment of uh, customary fishing areas whereby these traditional fishing folks lost their areas to aquaculture. Uh, there was a number of policy changes that came in whereby the state took a stand in favor of uh, aquaculture. Thereby they changed the number of policies. So they reserved the lagoon area for non-fishers and industries who can do aquaculture. Uh, there was, of course, court cases that were fought by the fisher cooperatives. Um, and there was court orders that were passed in 1991 and 93. Supreme Court of India, which is the federal court, and the state high court. And thereby, both these courts banned aquaculture within 1,000 meter radius of the lagoon itself. In effect, though, 60 to 80% of the lagoon until today is directly or indirectly under the control of illegal shrimp aquaculture, which is which is illegal because there are no in the court orders, orders ban this kind of activities. Uh, being the land of Gandhi, there was lots of protest movements and there was lots of you know uh, social movements that uh, were fought in the last couple of decades. But at the same time, as I said, uh, most of the lagoon has gone under encroachment, thereby towards a kind of privatization by illegal higher caste and supported by bureaucracy. In, 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 in that particular lagoon. The second driver I'm going to talk about is a hydrological one. So this used to be the old mouth, and this is a 28 kilometer channel that brings water with high tide and low tide uh, into the main lagoon. And this is the Eastern Ghar mountain ranges that fits into the lagoon uh, fresh water. So that's how it is a brackish water lagoon. Bay of Bengal, Indian Ocean fits in saline water and the fresh water comes from the catchment. However, as every lagoon, this mouth was getting closed because of siltation that were coming from this degraded uh, uh, catchment areas. Uh, there's, in 2001, the government decided to draze out a new seamount instead of renovating the old seamount. What they did was they dressed out a new seamount right in front of the lagoon. As in one sentence, I always say, uh, it worked as a toilet floss. Okay? High tide and low tide, just in front of the lagoon, it flosses water both ways. So there was an ecological disaster that took place in 2001. Okay, uh, causing a number of changes. Uh, this was the picture of 2008, uh, and now last year I was there. In fact, this year I was there uh, a couple of months before during the summer. This is now a three kilometer wide uh, water body, and the sand body that you see here has uh, been eroded because seamount always moves in its right hand direction. Okay, so uh, what happened uh, due to these two drivers was there was a lot of ecological change, you know, when you talk about a social ecological system, there are social subsystems and components, there are ecological subsystems and their components. In the ecological subsystem, which is the lagoon itself, uh, you find that there are, there are disturbances of saline, uh, saline resin because it all depends on the balance of freshwater flow and the uh, saline water flow. So when this big seamount was created right in front of the lagoon, the, the balance was disturbed and thereby the nature of the uh, lagoon was disturbed to a great extent. Changes in the nature of uh, what inflow and outflow, you know, what is toilet floss, so great speed of water that didn't allow anything to survive in the, in the lagoon itself. Uh, increase in sand infestation from the uh, Bay of Bengal was another uh, factor. 
loss of fish habitats and other flora and fauna because of all these disturbances that I am uh, talking about. Uh, invasion of saltwater species, and I can always take this example of barnacles, which are sea animals. The moment you find this kind of barnacles in the lagoon, that means the PPT, the, the pH factor of the of this uh, of the water has changed. You know? so you don't need any hard science to prove that. It's common sense. Okay, and they can affect your boards. They can affect your everything, as you can see. So if you don't clean this board, it's going to be uh, eaten away by the barnacles within a month, few months' time. Okay. Uh, and then you see strange creatures that you often see in the, uh, in the, in the marine system, but they started to appear in, uh, in, the, in the lagoon itself, which is enough indication that things are changing in the lagoon itself. Uh, the most significant impact though was uh, the variability, uncertainty and unpredictability that came into the lagoon. I'll give a few examples. This is red Indian shrimp that comes in the month of March. This is white Indian shrimp that comes in the month of uh, uh, end of June and July. Uh, people started to see them both together, okay? not knowing what's happening in the, in the lagoon itself. It, some people say it's climate change, some people say it's you know, local uh, you know, uh, hydrological changes that has taken place in the lagoon. So, uh, and there are a number of other significant changes in the ecological subsystem that were visible in the lagoon itself. Some of uh, the important ones, species seasonality was disturbed. Uh, some of the fish season turned into a crab season, so people would go with their fish, uh, uh, fishing gears for specific fish species, but they would find there are no species of fish, but there are crabs abundant in the, in the lagoon system itself. Uh, sudden abundance of certain species, fish habitats becoming crab habitats, disappearance of species, especially large fish. And we counted uh, that there were a number of uh, fish species that, were, that was lost. Okay? Uh, we asked a number of villages, 150 fisher villages, we did a survey uh, of all the villages to ask what kind of changes they are looking at. 135 villages responded by saying, yes, they do see significant changes in the ecological character of the lagoon itself. And there are a number of factors they provided in the questionnaire itself, which I'm not uh, giving you here. We asked uh, how many villages were consulted before the uh, seamouth was created. Uh, only 10 villages knew about it. They were not consulted directly, but they knew somehow about this uh, big intervention, which was the hydrological interventions. We tried to find out uh, uh, how many villages found that uh, there has been adverse impacts of shrimp aquaculture on, on their fishing activities. Uh, 135 villages out of 150, of course there are a number of invalid you know, answers that are not included in this survey. Uh, we then asked about uh, uh, what is the, how many villages feel, feel that there is adverse impact of the seamount. Uh, sorry about this, you know, this should have been higher, uh, but almost equally equal number of uh, villages. And there is a politics in there. Village, villages who are close to the seamount felt that they are adversely impacted, but villages who are uh, far off from the uh, seamount thought that they were not because it was helping them to do aquaculture in a way. Okay, so there is a politics in there that comes in. And these politics are very intense because of the caste system involved. Okay? Um, then uh, looking at uh, what are some of the social uh, subsystem level uh, ch changes or impacts, um, well, we did a photo documentation and I will just quickly show you what we found every day uh, fishers are catching. You know, they used to bring boat loads of fish, but now this is what they catch. Uh, this is a, a fishing gear that is rolled up here. If you open it up, it can hold up to 200 kilograms of fish. Okay, uh, but you see uh, fishing nets after fishing nets were picked up from the uh, water, and then you see what what they are catching. And enough evidence that the fish catch and the fish stock is going down uh, almost to the level of being zero there. Okay. Uh, 11 fish species in 2009 and 10 were recorded as missing from the fish basket. So they are extirpated, uh, export, not extinct, but extirpated locally, not no more available. And there's a list of those species which is available. Uh, we did the in depth uh, survey in two villages to find out those are the number of households going through all these horrible things. You know, food shortage, uh, depending on cash loans, paying um, interest rates as high as. Uh, 60% and some villages pay 120% uh, of, uh, of interest, which, uh, which puts them into a vicious cycle of poverty and uh, indebtedness. Uh, we found uh, one third of the adult population had already been uh, occupationally displaced there by they had migrated out to cities as job, uh, sorry, as construction laborers mostly, to Chennai, Hyderabad, Mumbai, and uh, 
uh, bigger cities, Bangalore and other places. And uh, those who engaged in local, local waste labor, half of them were women and half of them were uh, men. So there was a large scale displacement from the fishing occupation by this traditional customary fishing uh, communities. Uh, fish cooperatives don't exist if there is no fish in the lagoon, as you saw, so they became dormant. So significant number of fish cooperatives became dormant because there was not enough fish to deal with, no business. Okay? Uh, women uh, lost a lot of power because the size of the fish determines the power of the women. Men catch fish in the lagoon, they bring it back to the village, women take over control, they process the fish, they sell it in the market. The size of the fish going down means uh, uh, women becoming disembarked because you know, they, they don't have any significant amounts and significant size of fish to deal with. Okay? Uh, I mentioned about two drivers. Uh, these are the number of villages that uh, found out, in this particular year, two villages found out uh, significant amounts of migration from their village. So if you add up all these numbers, they are the total number of uh, official villages. Okay? Um, you can see that the numbers going up in the 1990s, year 4, 3, 2, 9, and, and then again going really significantly up after 2001. And in our research, I connected that to two uh, drivers. One is this significant phase of aquaculture, which brought, you know, kind of forced people to migrate because there was large scale conflicts, killings, and all that kind of stuff uh, with higher class people. And the significant stage number two, uh, in terms of out migration by those number of villages, uh, is linked to the seamount itself. So we proved that these are the two key drivers played out uh, in the local situation in terms of pushing people out of the fishing economy in terms of uh, physical separation which is out migration. Okay? Uh, so we asked then, so as customary fishing villages, what do you think about your connections or disconnections with the village? What is your level of relationship with the, with, with the lagoon itself? And 139 villages say they think that they have been significantly disconnected from the mother chilika or the lagoon itself. Okay, and there are a number of factors that has been recorded uh, why they felt that way. Okay, uh, how do I capture all these changes and uh, and stories? I use metaphors. You know, I ask people, so how do you, uh, what do you think? How do you express these changes? So I bring uh, four metaphors to tell you how how the fishers would tell you the story. One of the dominant metaphors is about chilika was our vata handi, which is the rice pot, and fish uh, as cash. If there is enough fish in the lagoon, it's, it's a rice and fish culture. Okay? So if there is enough fish in the lagoon, then there is enough rice and then enough food in the... You know, they don't need cash in the bank. Okay? And it signifies some kind of a metaphor for social economic indicators of change. The second one is, uh, what do we do when the Brahmins and the Kaurans like us? Brahmins and Kaurans are the higher caste people. 20 years back, if the Brahmin and the Kauran get engaged in fishing, they would be ostracized from their caste because these are higher caste people. And now, in the name of aquaculture, everybody uh, wants to do fishing. Okay? Uh, thereby, when these higher caste people get interested in fishing, the poor suffers. Okay? So what do we do when the higher caste people get in, you know, involved and get interested in fishing activities? Which is a more of a political uh, uh, indicator of change. You know, what happens in terms of power dynamics in that particular location? The third one is Mother Chilika is crying. And Mother Chilika is crying because of two reasons. Mother Chilika is crying because she is not well, she is sick because of all that ecological degradation. Mother Chilika is crying because all the sons, daughters, and grandsons and grandchildren are suffering, all the fishers and the, and the fisher families. So that indicates some kind of a biophysical and environmental indicator of change in the lagoon itself. And the fourth one is a more of a resilience perspective where for the poor, when hunger becomes unbearable, movement becomes the last resort. Even despite all that change, all that suffering, and all the kind of hardship that they have to face, uh, people have the strength to fight back, you know, in the land of Gandhi, of course. Uh, but people have keep the strength to fight back uh, in many ways. You know? So our study also captured what were the livelihood strategies and other options that they were picking up in terms of dealing with this uh, situation. Uh, in a 2010 paper, uh, Fikrit Barkis, we published and we tried to uh, develop indicators based on each of those, uh, those metaphors and these are the list of uh, uh, indicators uh, that follows the, uh, the metaphors itself. You know, so one, uh, three metaphors are placed in three categories of indicators of change and, uh, and, uh, and uh, different narratives given by people. Uh, that is one part of the story. However, the, the meta-narrative or the, the bigger story is brought out by the government. What you saw was negated by the government records. In, uh, 
In the government records, what you will find is a significant change in terms of uh, five-fold increase in the fish, ten-fold increase in shrimp, sixteen-fold increase in the crab, and annual income from just seventy dollars to twelve hundred dollars over this period of time. Okay, uh, any person with common sense would not accept this. You know, my son would not accept this at, at, at his, at, in grade five. Okay, uh, because this is not possible. You know, if this was really the truth, then this would have been a World Bank model or United Nations UNDP model by now. So you see the meta narrative that tries to negate the smaller narratives or stories expressed by the people itself. Um, so there's a paradox here. The paradox is government figures of production and income from Chilica paint a rosy picture of change, you know, because they have to prove that because they spend millions of dollars on digging out the, uh, the seamount. They cannot say that the seamount is not working. Uh, they have to prove that everything is well and good in terms of proving that the seamount intervention was a good intervention. However, at the same time, though, in the paradox, fish are still in less stories of deprivation. And it's not only one village, village after village, uh, in a sequence will tell you the same story. That means it's very pervasive. It is being found in each of those villages, okay? Uh, how do you capture this? You know, this is going to be my last slide. Um, if you look at the lagoon as a social ecological system, uh, a complex social ecological system and in human environment system, as I showed in the four, you know, uh, number three slide, um, you find there is environmental change that is taking place. You find that there is in human environment disconnection that is taking place you find the social ecological marginalization of these fisher folks that is taking place. And these are all intense processes that are connected to each other. And this could start from anywhere and move in the other direction. It could start from some kind of environmental change and then move into being, uh, causing social uh, ecological marginalization thereby bringing in disconnection. Or it could start from some kind of marginalization through external drivers and then lead the process. It could be a feedback process in terms of going either ways, okay? and. Uh, then there are different drivers, you know, aquaculture is a driver uh, of change, you know, driver according to MEA, Millennium Economic Ecosystem Assessment, is anything and everything that can cause a change in the system, okay? So there are these multiple levels of driver, starting from global stream market to national uh, state policies to interventions like Seamount that can cause this kind of, you know, change that interacts with the social ecological system, thereby cause this devastating change in terms of uh, the social ecological system itself. I don't have time. Anyway. Do, I have, do I have two minutes? Uh, you have about one minute. Okay. So okay. So that that, that, that concludes my presentation. But what I would uh, be interested in also showing uh, you is this uh, some quick slides. You know, if I have two minutes, then I can do it. <laughs> okay. Give it a best. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So uh, so I will tell you uh, some of the uh, some of the pictures of you know, the kinds of uh, emerging trends and small uh, narratives that are emerging. In one of the villages, this is an island village, and these pe people were given goats for livelihood projects. And the question is, what are these fishers going to do with goats when they are being customarily fishers, okay? So my question then is, uh, goats are going to replace fish. No, that's one trend that's coming up. Uh, thereby, you're tempering the culture-based livelihoods. You see more and more, uh, because this is an ecotourism site, ecotourism is the big uh, dolphin population that people come to see, and people also come to see the sea mouth you know, without knowing what it is causing to the local people. So uh, you're less, so seeing less of these fishing uh, uh, boats, more of these ecotourism boats there, but the question is, tourist boats are going to outnumber the fishing boats, and that's a trend in itself in terms of marginalization. Uh, what are these women doing in uh, water? This woman going knee deep water, bend down, pick shrimp from the mouth. Okay, and they work for three hours and pick two up two kilograms of uh, shrimp, and thereby they make a livelihood out of that. And these are all different techniques of traditional customary fishing gears. Uh, but at the same time, you're going to see lots of new aquaculture ponds coming up. Uh, thereby, you will ask the question that is capture fishery going to be lost to aquaculture? And that's a big trend in itself. Okay, village after village you go, you find uh, fishing gears stacked up like this. Uh, that means fishers are not going to f uh, going fishing in the lagoon anymore. So the number of absent fishers through migration is increasing and multiplying day by day. This is a group of uh, young people discussing about uh, migrating out to a city after the festival. Uh, and uh, you go into the village, I was invited to this marriage where this young guy was getting married with this uh, bride. And then I had a discussion with this guy and he was migrating after just 
uh, seven days of his marriage, leaving the bride uh, uh, back home. And that's in itself, homemakers become migrant laborers is a train in itself, okay? Uh, you see there is a three kilometer road that was done under the Prime Minister's, uh, this transmitted to Prime Minister's uh, road program. It's a federal program and this divides one of the channels of the Laguna into two. This year I was here, this part has been encroached because it's dried up, no connection with the main uh, channel itself. So there is a social ecological disintegration plan into disintegration that is taking place in the Laguna itself. And thereby you see the poor, the real people are not just being excluded but being eliminated uh, from the scene itself slowly. Okay? And you don't see the poor anymore. Uh, last slide. Uh, this is a very unusual scene for me having worked in that area for eight years now. Uh, this is a very happening place in the, in the household. Something is boiling here, people are eating, children are eating, there's a cat here. Uh, the, the, the fact that this is empty and this looks like this uh, tells me a story that this household is not cooking their food regularly. Okay? So when the wooden stove of the poor goes unlit, you just walk away from that place uh, three kilometers, the village is right behind there. Uh, you find this nice floating restaurant, pay $50, you would get a sumptuous meal uh, and they would take you into the lagoon. And then my question to you uh, is then where do you go from here in terms of uh, you know, everything? Thank you very much. Now, I believe Jacques is going to talk about his, uh, his experiences in uh, uh, Cow High Lagoon. Hi everybody, uh, I'm happy to be here today. Uh, so to start off where my research comes from, uh, I'm working with Derek Armitage and he was involved with a project funded by the International Development Research Centre, uh, it's a Canadian organisation, and he was working with Melissa Marsh uh, and some Vietnamese researchers. And so the Cao Hai Lagoon is part of the Tam Yang Lagoon in central Vietnam, and the project they were working on was sorting out some property rights and bringing in some uh, participatory community-based management approaches, so some co-management. And I'll talk a bit more about that later, but towards the end of that project, or in 2011, they came out with a paper saying uh, they thought that this was a transformative governance initiative. This is something that's coming in, it's going to really change the way that fishers are involved with management. So then my question was coming in and following up on this and talking about transformations. And my first question then is, what is a transformation? How do we go about talking about transformation as opposed to other types of change and what does that all mean? So what I'm going to talk about today then is how I'm drawing on Fisher perspectives to try to get a handle on what does a transformation look like. Does it matter where I point this? I just point it <laughs> so I drew on resilience thinking as kind of my entry point into thinking about what transformations are. So if you're not familiar with resilience, it's the ability of a system to absorb change while retaining the same structure and functioning feedback. So talk about the definition in different ways, but it really is talking about persistent. How does something uh, persist in the face of different types of change and drivers? Um, and there can be good resilience and bad resilience. So good re we often talk about building resilience, increasing resilience, but there's a flip side where there can be negative traps that are very persistent, but not necessarily desirable. So in India, the caste system is very persistent, even though it's been outlawed for what, 50 years, is it? Or more that the caste system has been thousands of years. No, but how long has it been outlawed? The caste system is not outlawed. It's not at all. Untouchability is not. Okay. So, anyways, point me. That was a bad example. <laughs> <laughs> I, I swear I've heard that example though. The caste system. Yeah, the, 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 some castes were untouchables. The constitution said there is there are no untouchables. Okay. The caste system is still. okay. So. Point is, good resilience, bad resilience. There are, there are systems uh, such as poverty and so on that can be very persistent, hard to undo the resilience of. The flip side then is where we look at tra transformations and where a system can flip from one characteristic to a different identity. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're talking about the difference between persistence versus kind of whole scale change. And so I'm drawing on this idea of system identity. Uh, there's a 2005 paper by Graham Cumming and colleagues where they talk about this idea of system identity because resilience is a hard thing to operationalize. And so the system identity talks about you know, what is the character and nature of a, of a particular system and if that changes we can talk about transformation. So that's really my entry point. And I really wanted to then draw on, instead of measuring individual variables, trying to figure out what are those controlling variables, instead looking at 
um, you know, what can local resource users and local knowledge tell us about how has the system identity changed or not? And I looked deeper into the literature and I found these kind of areas of interest, which I won't get into today, but just to talk about that, there's these um, points of interest that come into my research. Today I'm just going to talk about historical analysis and thresholds for system identity. So my field work, as I said, is in the Cowhide Lagoon, and that's part of the larger Tamiang Lagoon. So there's really a system of four lagoons. So um, here's the lagoon here. It's around 9,000 hectares, and up it connects to um, the other three lagoons that are part of this kind of larger system. Uh, not nearly as big as the Chilica Lagoon that Pratik was talking about, but still quite large. Uh, there's eight communities around the lagoon, and for this part that I'm talking about today, there was only three of the actual communities that I was working with for this part. Um, to tell you a little bit more about, to contextualize who I was working with, there's three sort of categories of fishers in this lagoon. The one is mobile fishers, so these are typically the poorest uh, fishers. This is the more traditional forms of fishing. Um, and the most common gear in use today is what's called a loon net. There are uh, kind of metal cages about yay big, but the 15 meters long. So there's the metal frame that hold it together, but about 15 meters long with holes for fish to enter. And they go along the, the bottom of the lagoon. There's estimates that in this area alone, there are around 10,000 in use. So these are nets that they drop, and every night they'll go check it and they can move them. Um, so there's a lot happening. That's mobile gear. Um, and I should say there are altogether more than 30 types of gear in use, but I'm just kind of giving you these broad categories. The fixed gear fishers are uh, any type of gear that's permanently fixed to the bottom of the lagoon. Uh, so the most common type is what's called fish corals. Uh, I think they're also called steak net traps in some areas, but large V-shapes, uh, about 250 meters long and 150 meters wide, uh, large V-shapes. So as fish swim in, they get fall along the V-shape to the bottom where then they're caught in the net and harvested. Uh, and so at one point, these were, and I'll show you pictures later on, were almost fully covering the surface of the lagoon. So it makes all kinds of problems. Lastly, that is aquaculture. Uh, and so I'll talk a bit more about the forms of aquaculture later on. For my actual research then, I did nine focus groups. So with each of those groups in each of those three communities. And we decided to separate them because of some power dynamics where you have uh, the more typically marginalized poorer fishermen but have a harder time uh, in these types of settings discussing uh, what issues they're facing. And so we separated these, these different groups and we came up with a series of different exercises trying to get at what is the system identity, how has it changed over time. So as I said, I'm going to focus a bit on the historical side uh, to start today. So there's kind of three, three levels or three stories that I want to weave through the historical side. So the first is environmental change. Uh, this is a coastal lagoon, uh, and meaning that there is exchange with the South China Sea there. Uh, and so salinity is variable always. Uh, however, up until 1999, so 80s into the 90s, uh, it was much more fresh water. The, the opening to the lagoon was more closed, uh, and so not as much exchange uh, of the seawater into the lagoon. In 1999, there was a massive flood, uh, not from a hurricane, but from uh, rain uh, upland that kind of pushed up. And it's hard to see in this picture, but this is a high water marker where it was about nine meters high. And so this blew open the mouth of the lagoon much wider open, uh, caused lots of damage, and so ever since then, the lagoon has been much more brackish, much more um, salt water. Um, and even to the extent that earlier this year when I was there, they had um, dredging going on to actually keep the mouth of the lagoon open. Um, and that's for different reasons related to a seaport going in, but it has definite implications for maintaining what the lagoon looks like now. And one other environment thing to mention uh, is that there was a big hurricane. They often have hurricanes, but a significant one in 1985 that really wiped out uh, a lot of the gear that was there, um, quite a few deaths and destruction. So that's the first kind of story, is the environmental change side. Uh, the second story to tell then is about economic growth and livelihoods. So late 1980s, uh, this is a socialist government in Vietnam, started putting in more open market reforms. And so allowing a bit more open market, encouraging export and so on. 
And so in that time, the early 1990s is when aquaculture was introduced, but it never really picked up through the 1990s. Uh, in that time, we kind of had markets developing a, li a little bit more um, skill development. These are fishers who didn't know how to do aquaculture, so there's a bit more kind of trial and error, pilot, st pilot studies. Um, but after that big flood in 1999 uh, and into the 2000s is when all of a sudden the lagoon is more brackish, it could support uh, especially tiger shrimp uh, much more readily, and aquaculture took off. And so by this time, in the early 2000s, um, I should also mention that the fish corrals that I was talking about had also really taken off. Um, after, after that big hurricane where things were destroyed and people were rebuilding new nets, they started using more synthetic materials, more effective um, materials that would stay in place long term, whereas in the past they were using bamboo as nets. And so you have this kind of increase in market availability, increase in wealth and technology input, different types of nets coming in, to the extent that by the early 2000s there was just a lot going on in the lagoon. Um, a lot of fixed gear and a lot of aquaculture were really taking over what was happening. And so just to illustrate that then, uh, really the red line is what I want to show you is the increase in aquaculture production in those early, uh, just after 2000 and up to around 2004, 2005. And we see this peak is when uh, disease started showing up. So there's lack of regulation uh, on the actual um, shrimp fry coming from shrimp farms. And so the disease was coming in that way. And since then it hasn't really picked up for a variety of reasons that I won't get into today. But just to sh I want to show this kind of messy period of really increased intensity. So then the third story I, I want to weave into that is property rights and governance and management approaches. So historically there was uh, what's called vans. They were family-based management units and that was um, all mobile type fishing. Some fish corrals um, was really was what was happening there. Um, and that's, it was open, acts pro open access property rights, like common property, um, and regulation, there were regulations that really dealt with um, fishing from a government level because it wasn't too intense uh, up to that point. But throughout this period when, I didn't explain that well. Point being, we go from a customary type approach to property rights and management, and as we got into this period in the early 2000s, that customary approach was falling apart. Um, because these fish corrals had taken over the surface of the lagoon and aquaculture had come in and taken over the rest of the surface of the lagoon, um, basically that traditional customary open access property rights was failing. Um, and I'll show you pictures in a minute of just how uh, covered the lagoon was in, in uh, everywhere you look at those nets. And so that has huge implications for navigation where I had some fishers say, in this period, it would take them six hours to get to where their fish ponds are. And then they don't have to go home, they have to go to where they're selling their fish before they get home. So there's a lot of time in travel. Um, this water stagnation is a big pro was a big problem. Uh, and then there's conflict, where you just have mobile fishers going on top of other mobile fishers, going on top of fixed gear fishers. All kinds of things happen. And this is where then that project I was talking about with uh, Derek Armitage and Melissa Marshby came in, 2006 to 2011. And what they were dealing with was these property rights issues where um, on land in Vietnam it was much easier to delineate who owned what land, uh, whether it was formal ownership or um, just different types of property rights and access. And so this project really aimed at first developing fishing associations as a model for getting fishers um, into a collective organization. And then they develop what's called the TERF, uh, Territorial User Rights for Fishers. So in the map I showed you earlier where uh, the lagoon was segmented off into different areas, uh, they developed these maps based on communities and where people fish. Uh, and so each fishing association then corresponds with a fishing zone. Uh, and so by all means, it's been a very successful approach. It's dealt with these property rights issues. It's resolved some conflicts. So here's a picture where you can see what the surface of the lagoon looked like in some areas where it was just net after net after net. Uh, now it looks more like this, where you see the fish corals in straight lines, and you have areas for fishing, not areas for navigation, you have areas for mobile fishers to move around. Also, the um, aquaculture has now 
now been taken out of the lagoon altogether. So it's only along the edge of the lagoon where you have uh, what they call highland and lowland palms, depending on how it connects to the lagoon. So this leads me then to the question of, well, where has system identity changed and can we see some thresholds between these areas? So for me, what really appeared, and I wasn't aware of when I started my research, is that this flood in 1999, I don't know if you call it a threshold, I don't know if you call it a tipping point, that's something that we still have to figure out exactly what, if that's an exact threshold or not. But point being that there is some kind of change in identity from this more open access, uh, lower intensity use, no aquaculture, into this time where there's just really intense resource use, where fishers talk about everything changed. I ask them what stayed the same, and they say, well, we still have boat races every year. Mm -hmm. you know, and they say, everything changed. Like, the options for livelihoods, how they sell things at the market, the different types of nets they use. Um, those loom nets I mentioned, I should have mentioned, they didn't come in until around the year 2002, 2004. So this is just altogether things look different. And then when I asked them, okay, well, what about when the co-management, the turfs came in? What kind of changes did you see then? And that's where, when I talked to the different groups, I have very different answers. Only two out of the nine focus groups really thought that there was some kind of substantial change and that co-management was really existing. The rest of them said, well, it's just on paper. It hasn't really changed anything for us. We're still doing the same things we're always doing. So this is where I question where, at least not yet, I'm not quite seeing it, some kind of transformation in this latest phase. And there's two sort of reasons that I've identified. One is that there's actually 15 fishing associations. So these are the, the eight towns or villages I talked about, but some of them have multiple fishing associations. But in Vinyang and La Pabina are the only two that are considered to be actually successful or functional, in that they have an operating budget, they have a leader who is um, on board and active. And so, Vinyang was where the pilot site was from the IVRC project. Uh, La Bin was another site where they had a good project uh, leading. All the other fishing associations were led by a fish, uh, food and agriculture organization, FAO project, that used more of a checklist approach. Like, okay, we did the capacity building, we held a workshop. Okay, we did this, we did this, we did this. And so, all these fishing associations aren't really working. Second reason then is that there's real variability on how these territorial user rights are operating. So the best example is the mobile fishers. This is a loon net. And so what these uh, mobile fishers talked about was that they follow the fish. So historically, they would move anywhere within the, in the lagoon uh, to go where the fish are, to go where, the, where shrimp are and so on. And so if there's a storm, it pushes salt further in, it pushes species further in. If there's rain, it pushes it the other way. And so now with the turfs, they're trapped within their zone. So if they go into another fishing zone, all of a sudden they're doing illegal fishing, there's more conflicts that way. And so it depends on where you live in the lagoon, they're having positive and negative effects. Uh, same with the, um, fi the fixed gear fishers, they're seeing some positive, some negative. Um, not that different for them, in the sense that they were always in one place. Uh, but point being then is that, we can't paint this with one brush and say it's been totally successful. So my last slide then, just some takeaway points. One is that um, I, don't, I haven't seen evidence of a transformation yet. That doesn't mean that this can't be part of a longer term process, but it's a big question in terms of as researchers, what can we call things transformative you know, before they've happened? You know, we want to talk about this positive aspect of transformation to give us this language of, you know, instituting positive change, but um, we need to be careful. Even though this is a positive so far, it's not universally beneficial. So second then is that we can use resource user perspectives rather than measuring all these variables. I can go in there and measure catch and salinity and pH and all these kind of things, but we can really talk to resource users to get some valuable insights. Um, and then thirdly then just acknowledge and, re and respect that there is a difference, that we can't just paint these communities with one brush. So, that's all I've got. Thank you.